I'm Mike Pratt. I'm uh, Associate Provost and Dean of the Regional Campuses, and uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight to uh, Miami University Hamilton and the 27th Racial Legacies and Learning Town Hall Meeting. Um, tonight is a, is a special, besides being Valentine's Day, tonight is a special day um, uh, and a heartwarming day, uh, special because our speaker tonight exemplifies what this program is all about, and heartwarming because our speaker tonight is a native of the uh, city of Hamilton, a graduate of uh, Miami University, and attended the Miami University Hamilton campus. Uh, he's one of our own, uh, a great source of pride from the city and from the university. And without further ado, I would like to welcome to the podium Hamilton's mayor, the Honorable Pat Moeller, who is going to uh, introduce our speaker. Pat? Thank you, Doctor. Good evening. This evening, we celebrate mentoring, we celebrate making an impact, and we celebrate an innovator, a high-tech leader, a man from Hamilton, Ohio, and as Dr. Pratt said, Miami University. And that man is Dr. Juan Gilbert. Dr. Juan Gilbert is an ideas professor and chair of the Human Centered Computing Division in the School of Computing at Clemson University. He is also a professor in the Automotive Engineering Department at Clemson. He is a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement Science, an ACM Distinguished Scientist, a National Associate of the National Research Council of the National Academies, an ACM Distinguished Speaker, and a senior member of the IEEE Computer Society. That sounds really smart. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I just said. Um, Dr. Gilbert was uh, named one of the nation's top African-American scholars by diverse issues in higher education. And in 2011, Dr. Gilbert was given a presidential award for excellence in science, engineering, and mathematics mentoring by President Barack Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Juan Gilbert. Good evening. So uh, what I want to do tonight, um, it's going to be more of a conversation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do and tell you a little bit about this subject of innovation, mentoring, society, and how one person can make a difference. If you look here at, at my title, and I do this thing called human-centered computing. So I want to start there because it's going to be quite relevant to a lot of things that I've done and um, it explains who I am in many ways. So when I graduated from University of Cincinnati with my PhD, I went and interviewed for faculty positions. And people often said, so what do you do? Who are you? And it was because I was doing things that others weren't. And what we discovered was I was doing this thing called human-centered computing. So human-centered computing deals with the idea or the concept of integrating technology, people, culture, uh, policy, et cetera, towards applied or real-world problems. Very interdisciplinary aspect, uh, integrating multiple disciplines and, and doing things that weren't very well accepted at the time. So I was fortunate enough to be hired at uh, Auburn University. And when I took that job in Auburn in 2000, um, it was interesting as I moved through the ranks as a professor that in 2000, about 2004, 2005, the National Science Foundation had created a program called Human Centered Computing. And Juan Gilbert owned and still owns humancenteredcomputing.com and .org. <laughs> so it, I came away looking like a genius because everyone said, man, this guy knew it before anybody else did. And that story is interesting because that's something that occurred to me all along. I remember being at Hamilton High and um, taking the ACT and applying to college, and I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I got a 21 on my ACT. 
and the highest you can get is a 36, right, on ACT. So I said, 21 is okay. So I took it again, and I got a 23. And at Miami University, if you had, I think it's a 25 or 27, you got this scholarship. So I was like, forget that, I ain't taking it again. I don't think I'm gonna hit a 25. But I was told that, uh, okay, with that kind of score, you, you'd probably be an okay college student. And then we see how that worked out. I was told when I was in graduate school, they said, the stuff you're doing, that really doesn't fit. I was told quite often that you can't, you know, you can't do things that way. And it was interesting that I, I made decisions that I could. I was told that if you're going to play sports, you can't do good in school, too. That's, the two don't really go together. And I said, I'm going to do it anyway. So I had, I don't know if I became a rebellion or something, but it, it was part of my culture and my nature to defy the odds of what people said I could or could not do. So human-centered computing was created. I graduated. I was able to get a job. And even when I was working there, the things that I published, some of you are faculty and some of you are students, you'll understand this. Things that I published, they criticized and said, that doesn't fit in our traditional venues. But I brought in grant money so I developed this philosophy, and my students, and I tell my students this all the time. You have to be so good that even the people that don't like you have to acknowledge you. So it's about excellence, and when I talk about innovation, this all comes together. And I, I pose the question, and I'll pose it to you. Is it possible for any human being to create something, I don't care what it is, anything, in the absence of who you are. Now let you think about it for a minute. Is it possible for any human being to create something in the absence of who you are? I can look at any device, any technology, any artifact, and you tell me who created it, and I can explain to you why it is what it is. What I'm getting at, it's impossible for you to create things in the absence of who you are. So what does that mean? If you have a certain segment of the population creating things that is excluded by another segment, you should be able to notice that. i give you some ideas. A pimped ride. <laughs> now, I saw above your heads, some of you didn't see it, but I saw it, a vision of what a pimp ride is. So, you know what that means. Can I go to GM and buy a pimp ride? Can I go to BMW and buy one? No. But what is a pimp ride? It is something that is taken by a group and modified to adjust their own cultural settings or likings. I'll give you another bad example. I grew up in the 80s, right? So, pagers were kind of popular around that time. But the purpose of the pager was created and it was used primarily by doctors and physicians. But there was a certain segment who got a hold of those and used them in a way that we all know that was not very, uh, how should I say, well received. Again, adopting technology to suit one's liking. I'll tell another story. A cell phone, the Motorola Razor. Some of you will remember that phone. Very thin, it's making a comeback actually. That phone was very important because of one unique aspect. Not only was it thin, but it came in colors. And those colors were black, white, uh, it was a gray, and there were other colors. However, the team that created that at Motorola had a meeting one day and they were discussing what the next thing they were gonna do. And there was a woman in that meeting, from India, an Indian woman, and she said, I think we should create a pink cover. And the guy said, ha ha, no, that'd never sell. They work for her now. <laughs> that was the number one selling phone, was the pink. 
there are more women than men. Women were more interested in the color than the men were. So again, you can't create something in the absence of who you are, and this will be very important in a second. So I'll move on to some innovations that I've been fortunate to be associated with. And I'll start with uh, one that is um, almost painful to talk about. So in the year 2001, I created a company called DigitalSoundExchange.com. And that company you haven't heard about because it doesn't exist anymore. It was short-lived. But that company at that time was what you know today as iTunes. If I had a mentor or somebody tell me, wow, that's a pretty good idea, you should patent that. This place would be a lot bigger right now. <laughs> so um, that was something that I, I got into and I had that idea because the record industry was saying that they didn't want file sharing and they didn't want people to have digital music, so they wouldn't talk to me. And then later, everyone's doing it. The other innovation I like to talk about is called Prime 3. I was fortunate enough in 2003 uh, to be sitting in a meeting with my students and listening to someone give a presentation about electronic voting. And this person said, you can't do it. You can hack it, it won't work. No, it can't be done, no, no, no. And I'm sitting there with my students and we said, I think we can do this. You see a pattern here, right? So, uh, so we went back to the lab and we created this system that allows you to vote by touching a screen or wearing a headset and actually speaking into the headset or even simple as blowing into the headset. So what does that mean? Well, people that can't see, people that can't hear, people that can't read, even people without arms can all privately and independently vote using that technology. We had created the world's most accessible voting machine in the history of mankind. And in doing so, we didn't know it at the time. Later I found that out, so I had to tell everybody that. So in doing so, it was challenging because I wanted to get funding for our research. And so I wrote all these proposals and one side would say, well, this is pretty good, but you didn't talk enough about this. So I talk about that. Then they say, well, it's pretty good, but you didn't talk about the other thing. So they ran me around in circles. And then a kind man from the National Science Foundation said, Juan, I like what you're doing. Uh, write me a proposal and I'm gonna give you $90, $98,000. So it helped start the project. Fast forward to 2011. Uh, I wrote a proposal. The United States Election Assistance Commission created an initiative called Accessible Voting Technology. Wrote a proposal and we won a $4.5 million grant. That grant has empowered us to do some unique things. You would not believe what has happened since I won that grant. People will call me, Apple called me, Microsoft calls me, everybody calls me, see what we're doing. Uh, long story short, you'll hear more about this. This year we will be doing elections in the United States of America using this technology. So that's gonna be interesting. So when you turn on the TV and you, you see somebody on there, you say, I know him, that's Juan. And you see all these kids from my lab. And it's not what people expect. I'll give you an example. This system, when I created it, uh, Dan Rather found out about it. And he came and did a story on us. So they said, we're going to do a story on voting. We were in Alabama at the time. So they come and they go through Alabama and they're getting all the footage. And he walks in. And he walks into the room and he says, so where's Dr. Gilbert? And I'm standing next to him. <laughs> and he said, that's him. And Dan goes, oh. And he whispered to him, these are your students? And I say, yeah. They came back four times to shoot us. They never aired it. They got all this video. I don't know what they're doing with it. <laughs> but uh, he came back and shot us four times. And you say, well, what, what was the big deal? We didn't fit his perspective of what computer scientists or people who are doing this look like. And I get that a lot. I used to play this trick on my students. So on the first day of class, I come and I sit in the back and just wait. And then I say to one of them, I say, so what do you know about this guy? And they say, I don't know. But I heard he was pretty easy. I heard he was hard. I heard this and that. 
And they say, okay, well, he's not here, I'm about to go. I say, all right, well, let, I stand up and say, well, let's get class started. And they go. <laughs> Should we drop the class now? <laughs> but anyway, so again, we didn't fit the stereotype, but we were able to do something that has never been done. And we all will benefit from that in some way or another. Uh, companies are going to be adopting our technology and it'll be out there. So uh, it's very likely you'll be voting on a machine in the future that we created. Then there, 2003, another innovation. Now this one is, is rather controversial, but it was interesting. In 2003, United States Supreme Court uh, saw a case on affirmative action, University of Michigan. There was a white female that applied to the law school and she was denied admission. And she claimed that she had been discriminated against because uh, Michigan had a point system at the time. And so if you were from an underrepresented group, you got points. So I remember in June 2003, turning on the television and seeing a reporter put up a split screen and had one side, those that were for this ruling and those that were against it. And on both sides, they were having a party. And they said they both had won. And it occurred to me at that moment in time that everybody had it wrong. I saw it differently. See, that problem occurred. It wasn't about race, gender, national origin. That, that was the scapegoat in this problem. The real problem was a capacity issue. Whenever you have more qualified people applying for uh, admission than you have available slots, by definition, you're turning away someone who's qualified. And it just so happened they turned away someone who was qualified, motivated, resourceful, and angry. So they ended up in court. <laughs> so when I saw that, um, I, I realized that what people wanted was a holistic admissions or review process. And what, they all understood it from the idealistic perspective, meaning if it's holistic, I read the, and review the entire application such that no single attribute is the determining attribute. Everyone understood that, but no one knew how to do it. So I wrote software again called Applications Quest, and this software actually accomplished that goal. And I went around the country telling people about it, um, and it was interesting, a group of guys uh, I think Gary's here, uh, Hunter. Uh, so Gary's here, so Gary's part of the story. There were a group of, group of guys who saw what I was doing and said, we like this. We want that technology and we want to license it. And that group uh, owns a, a magazine called Diverse Issues in Higher Education. So a company was formed called Applications Quest. And in this case, it was interesting because I would go around the country doing studies with universities and showing them how this worked. Meaning this tool would give them a holistically more diverse admissions class in a fraction of the time, meeting the same academic achievement levels. But they all were afraid that they didn't want to be sued over this. Well, Clemson University is using it, in particular in the School of Nursing. And Applications Quest is growing. Medical schools are looking at it now, and I have a bunch of other places looking at it. So that was another innovation that came out of my lab, and an idea we had that dealt with uh, a societal issue. I'll talk about a couple more. There's another one. I was in an airport where I spend a lot of time, and I was delayed. So I sat in a seat, and I sat on a magazine, and on the cover of that magazine, it had someone driving a car and texting, and about to hit a lady. So it said, texting while driving will kill you. And I said, oh, that's a problem, but I think we can fix that. See, the thing keeps happening. So I went back to the lab, and it was interesting because I had an idea on how to fix this. So what I had noticed that there were companies that were creating apps and things that would allow you to get a text message and then read it to you. And there were some people trying to allow you to press a button and transcribe a text message. And what I discovered was that if a person received a text message and it read it to them, it would say something like, uh, what up, Mo? I'll see you later, man. LOL. And the text message would say, lol, or something. And the person would say, what? 
that defeated the whole purpose because they looked at it while they were driving, they ran over somebody. <laughs> so I discovered that if you give some people something to look at, they look at it. So we created this technology called voicing, V-O-I-C-E-I-N-G. And voicing is a unique way to communicate while driving. It allows you to send a short message and that's all you get, it's nothing to look at. And I could go into detail later and I could actually show it to you if you wanted to see it. But uh, I created this technology and we did studies. So this is kind of funny and you'll see a picture of this later. But we did some studies where we have a driving simulator and I took a group of college kids and I told them to drive and send a text message. And I told some to drive and talk to someone next to them. I told some to drive and talk on the phone. I told some to drive and use our voicing. And what we discovered was that, interesting enough, college kids would rather talk to a machine than a person. That was the first thing. The second thing, they were actually pretty good at texting while driving, which was terrifying because that means they've been practicing a lot. The third thing we discovered was that voicing was less distracting than actually talking to a person next to them. So we presented our research results to BMW. They hired one of my students. He's in Germany, started February 1st, and they're putting us in their cars in 2014. So the licensing deals haven't been worked out yet. We'll see how that works out. I don't think I'm gonna get anything out of that one. Because uh, BMW came to South Carolina and uh, they got a pretty sweet deal with the university. But here's the benefit, and I tell my students this as well. Sometimes it's better to be known as the person who invented or created something than to be the owner of that technology. And we'll see how that plays out in about five years. So that's one, another innovation, and uh, the last innovation I want to talk about is called Atomless. So this one is uh, near and dear to my heart, and it has a story that's related to Miami University. So when I was at Miami, I had to take Econ 201. I don't know if they still have that class. But I had to take that class, and I won't tell you who I took it with, because it'd be embarrassing. But I took the class, and I went to class every day, and I sat in the front seat in the first row. Did everything I was supposed to. We had a test and I failed it. So being the, uh, the, the intelligent student I was and savvy student I was, I dropped the class. <laughs> and I took it with someone else. <laughs> and when I did, I did very well in the class. So it occurred to me, it wasn't that I couldn't learn econ maybe that first guy didn't teach it the way that was conducive for me. So I had this idea. I said, what if I change the instructional model? So in tutoring, you have one instructor and one student. In a classroom, one teacher and many students. I said, what if you could change it so that for every student, you had many teachers who all taught the same thing, but they explained it a different way. So I, I built this system. This was actually my dissertation research. Um, and I, I tested it out. And I, I discovered something that was very interesting. So many of you educators in the room will or relate to this, which is you know about the bell curve. The bell curve distribution says that in a classroom, learning outcomes are distributed such that uh, there are few people who really got it and did very well. And then there's this big group in the middle who got it at different times and did okay, and then it's a few on the end, well, you know, they, they didn't do that well. <laughs> That's the bell curve. So with this approach, which I call multiple instructor, single learner, missile, with that approach, the curve was skewed. Everybody really got it, and a few kinda got it, but no one didn't get it at all. So, when I did that, we took that uh, system and we said, okay, so what you have to do is be able to explain things multiple ways to different people. And we made some more discoveries. For example, uh, I discovered that traditional learning styles theory was wrong. For many, many, many years, if not decades, we thought that there was this thing called learning styles, meaning if I gave you this test, and it was called a learning style inventory, 
and you filled it out and I could classify you as a visual learner or something. And I said, okay, if you're a visual learner, that means I'm gonna teach you this stuff and I teach it to you visually. And I discovered that was not right. That was incorrect. What I discovered was that if you look at a course or anything you teach someone, you have lessons and you have multiple lessons. And what I discovered with this system was that people's learning style actually changed in that course from lesson to lesson. So you may be visual for the first so many lessons, but it could change and you need a different uh, auditory way in another lesson or something else. So when I made this discovery, some people weren't happy about it, but it showed that uh, by using these technologies through innovation, we can make discoveries and see things that we couldn't see before because before we had this kind of technology, you couldn't afford to have many people sit in the room and teach a single person. But with technology, we were able to do that. And so Atomless, uh, we received grants from the National Science Foundation. This software uh, has gone into boys and girls clubs. So what we, what we discovered was that, said we gotta teach things differently to people. So we had this idea, for in particular, we were in Chicago and looking at a group of African-American kids in Chicago. And these kids said, I can't do math. I can't do it because my mom and my grandma couldn't do this hereditary thing. <laughs> I don't like math. I, I just can't do it. So I said, what do you like? And these kids told us they liked video games, they liked hip hop. And so we came up with this idea to teach these kids math using hip hop and video games. And these kids were going home singing the lyrics and playing these games and things. And so it came from an interesting place. Some of you will remember this. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand because you'll show your age. But Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> Many people will remember that. Schoolhouse Rock, I'm just a bill on. <laughs> so when was the last time that aired on television? <laughs> Wasn't yesterday. Many, many years. And what I found is that that was introduced on Saturdays as a commercial many years ago, but everyone remembered that, even 20 years later. So we created those lessons using a theme like that. And these kids are singing the lyrics and they're remembering algebra and they don't even know it. <laughs> and so we, we saw a change in these kids. So it, it was something interesting to be able to do, and we call this a culturally relevant way of, of doing pedagogy or computing, whereby we define culture as who you are and what you do. So we find out who you are, which are things about you you can't easily change, and what you do are things you practice. And these kids were African-American kids that consumed video games and hip hop, and we were able to teach them on their own terms. And this is in boys and girls clubs in Texas and in New York and in um, Alabama now. So when I started this, I talked about the concept of who you are and how that plays a role on uh, innovation. And that's quite relevant because I find that even with the presidential award, I find that mentoring plays a huge role in that. And I think building a diverse workforce is a national priority of the United States of America. And you say, how do I know that? The president told me so, and he really did. <laughs> so it's very important. So if you look at, and I told the kids in Hamilton High and in Middletown High that the world is different for them than it was when I graduated. Meaning, I only had to compete against people in the United States. They're in a global competitive market. And the advantage we have, if you look at the United States, we're 300 million people. Look at Asia, it's a billion people. So statistically speaking, they have way more brain power than we do. But there is a difference. I think our diversity as a nation lends to creativity and innovation. The ideas we have are spawned by the things that we know, the things we experience. And being around people that are like you doesn't support much of that. 
You learn more from being in a diverse environment with diverse people. And so when I went through my PhD program, it was an interesting experience because for all those years when I was in graduate school, I had never seen an African American with a PhD in computer science. I thought I was the first and only in the world. <laughs> and one day I ran into one and she, uh, she was uh, the department chair at Spelman College in Atlanta. And she said, uh, no, you're not the only one. There's more of us. And she introduced me to him. And when I graduated, I remember thinking, if I become a professor, I never have a lab without diversity. And I never have just one student of any group. So I always have at least two. Well, that was interesting because I started out with two, then two became four, then it became eight, and I ended up with like 16. And so what I was able to do was take these students into my lab, and we were able to do something special. We were able to do innovative things that other people look at and say, wow, that was cool, but what's the big deal? Which is a compliment in my business because I created a voting system that is so simple that when you look at it, you go, what's the big deal? And that's a compliment because it has to serve every segment of the population. And if it is that sophisticated, surely I'm going to not serve a segment of the population. So what I was able to do was to create a unique environment at Clemson University now. I did it at Auburn as well. My PA, the PhD program in human-centered computing at Clemson University is the United States' first and only predominantly African-American PhD program in computing at a predominantly white institution, which is an interesting feat because uh, there's so few in the nation. But that has allowed us to do some innovative things. And you say, so how did that happen? What, what was the big pitch. How do you get people to come work with you? Well, what I discovered through research is that women and minorities in particular are people from underserved populations, people that have a hard time coming through life in most cases, tend to want to help others, tend to want to improve upon that condition for other people. And so when they look at computing or science or technology, they say those people work in cubicles, they have pocket protectors, they uh, wear g funny glasses, and this is true. This is what the, the research says. And uh, they date ugly women. <laughs> I am not, this is what the literature says. So Juan Gilbert walks into the room, and he, I didn't fit any of that. And, uh, and if, you, if you saw my wife, you really know I didn't fit that. <laughs> And, and people would say, so how is that? And I show them the things we work on and they say, wow, you can actually use technology and things to make a difference in society. Because they thought we work, work, work with artifacts and phenomenon. They didn't realize that we can actually help people. And so now there's a whole group of people that are interested in what we're doing for that main point. So when you connect the dots and you say there are societal issues, you have innovation, and you add diversity of thought, you get solutions that are unthought, that haven't been seen before. So I, I want to uh, wrap this up with a few pictures. This is my team, or part of my team, from the past. So if you look here at this, uh, you'll see Christy here. Christy Goss. Christy's from uh, Alabama. She was uh, one of my master's students. If you go home tomorrow or tonight and the post office, United States Post Office, came to deliver a package to you, they stick a little slip in your mailbox. And on the back of that slip is a number you can call to set up your pickup. And that's an automated system that you talk to. She designed that system. Uh, Here's another shot of some of my students. These students are all getting PhDs or have a PhD. David Thornton here has a PhD. He's at Jacksonville State in, um, in Alabama. Uh, I'll talk about Yolanda. 
let's see, Wanda is one of my PhD students now finishing up. Uh, Kenneth is a PhD student finishing up. At, and he's teaching at Morehouse right now. And here are some more of my students uh, from my lab. And Edong is set, Mick Pong. She is, uh, had her PhD, she's a department chair in, um, in Montgomery, Alabama now. I'll show you this one here. So this is a more recent one. They actually made fun of me because if you notice, it looks like I was thinking. <laughs> so uh, these are some of my students. Again, Kenneth is at Morehouse. Kristen's finishing her PhD. She just got married. Shanae just completed her PhD. It was very bittersweet because, you know, when you get your PhD, at graduation, your advisor comes and hoods you. And graduation day was the same day I was going to the White House. So I didn't get to hood my students. So it was very bittersweet. But I bought her a unique backpack from the White House bookstore <laughs> with the White House seal on it. So uh, Wanda, she's from Haiti originally. Uh, she finished her PhD with me last year. And she's on her way back to Haiti doing some research. She wants to be a professor. Um, let's see, Jerome, he's from Alabama. Uh, he's finishing his PhD at Clemson University. And here's another group. This is an interesting story behind each one of these. Ignacio is my student who got hired by BMW. And you can see him doing the driving simulator. And if you could read it, he crashed while he was texting. <laughs> Han Hanan. Al Nazami, she's from Jordan. And uh, she did her undergraduate work at Youngstown State. So she grew up in Ohio in many ways. And if you heard her talk, she has a Midwestern accent. You would never know she was from Jordan. But she's fluent in Arabic. And she's very interesting, uh, her dynamic with the lab. She actually marks on her forms that she's African American. <laughs> Josh E. Candom is finishing his PhD. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in industrial design. And he's probably one of the most wanted people on, on the earth. And all the companies want him because he knows how to design things very well. BMW's after him, Intel, Chrysler, a whole bunch of places want this guy. Aquasia Martin, she's from Mississippi. Aquasia is interesting. She's doing her research. And actually, if she's successful, it's going to touch many of you in here. So let me tell you what she's working on. I'll give you the scenario. Papa is at home. And then Papa's grandson comes in. And the grandson has a little cold. So the grandson went to the store, got some cough medicine, and got better. But unfortunately, the grandson passed on what he had to Papa. So the next day, Papa says, son, Throw the little itch. What was that you took? Why don't you go get me some of that? Papa gets the medicine and takes it, and it has sugar in it, and Papa was a diabetic. Aquatius writing a system that would intervene to help people in that scenario. So you wouldn't have an adverse effect with medication you're already taking with over-the-counter medication. Jerome Dunbar, he's from Jamaica. And he's our resident Jamaican, and he does what Jamaicans do. <laughs> he's a lot of fun. Uh, he's getting his PhD with me. He went to St. Thomas Aquinas, a small university in New York. He joined my lab. He came in the summer and joined my lab, and he never left. So now he's going to get his PhD. Marvin Andujar is joining my lab. He was an undergraduate student in my lab two summers. His university is King University. They paid him to come work with me. And he was so good, now I'm going to pay him to work with me. <laughs> I loved him. Uh, France Jackson from South Carolina. She's an industrial engineering major, getting her master's degree, and she works in my lab. You can't see Karen back here, but Karen is uh, uh, a digital production arts major. Uh, at Clemson University, most people don't know this, but in our school of computing, when you watch Avatar or Star Wars, all the major films, a Clemson graduate worked on that. And she's going to be one of those people in the future. Uh, Stevie 
Marie Hawkins. She's a student at Spelman and she was in my lab this summer. Now, this one here and this one here, you can see them, they're not students. Those are two of my faculty. This is Shawnee Daly. She got her PhD from MIT. I just hired her last fall. This is Damon Woodard. He got his PhD from Notre Dame and he's been at Clemson and I'm actually, he's in the process of getting tenure and promoted and he's doing extremely well. So those are two of my mentees that actually work uh, in my division. So to wrap this up, this is graduation day. Felicity Williams. Oh, Felicity Williams. <laughs> Felicity came, got her bachelor's degree at Southern University in computer science, came to Auburn University when I was there, got a master's degree in computer science, and cried in my office when she was getting her PhD so much so I just couldn't take it. <laughs> she finally graduated, and I can't tell you exactly what she does, because people will probably jump out of these rooms with uh, black suits on and take me away. She works for the Department of Defense, and that's all I can tell you. Cayo Soares, he's an interesting case. Cayo uh, got his PhD with me, and Cayo uh, is, is a Hispanic student, and when he came to the lab, he integrated very nicely, but he came in and he said, before, I didn't even notice, it was till after he graduated and he gave a speech. And he said, it, when I came to Auburn University, I had bad, uh, a bad perspe uh, perspective, perspective of blacks. But then I joined Dr. Gilbert's lab, and I've never been the same since. Yolanda McMillan. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> Yolanda got her undergraduate at Tuskegee, got her master's at Vanderbilt, and her PhD with me. And she was told that she would never be able to get a PhD and now she works at Elizabeth City State in North Carolina. So here's the theme of my lab. This is the actual banner in my lab, change the world. Our culture is actually centered around changing the world. If we are successful, then we will have changed the world. That's what we're about and what human-centered computing is about. So from this point on, what I wanna do is just share a couple of photos with you. Uh, everyone asks me about the president visit, right? So let me talk about that. So these guys that you see me with, over here, the older guy is Bryant York. He was my mentor, and he helped me and taught me how to write grant proposals, and I got pretty good at it, actually. And he's still one of my mentors. He has some very interesting uh, stories. Uh, he was from Boston, and when he was in graduate school, he knew Angela Davis. Uh, and so he asked her out one time and she said, uh, would you be willing to blow up something for me <laughs> as a joke? So he says, I don't know. Brian Blake. Brian and I both got our PhDs at the same time and he got his PhD at George Mason University. He nominated me for the presidential award. And we are uh, colleagues and good friends. Brian Blake is uh, actually a professor now at Notre Dame and an associate dean there as well. I think he's a couple, few years younger than me, but he's a rising star. And so these men have uh, definitely helped me in my pursuits and uh, I wanted to show you them as it relates to the president. So actually we're in the Eisenhower uh, building right here. I know y'all know who that is. That's my mom and my wife, Robin in front of the White House, and I don't know who that is. <laughs> but he's pretty serious. And here we are at one of the award ceremony. Uh, again, Mom and Robin, that's my wife. See, I told you she didn't fit the stereotypes. <laughs> Here's some more pictures. Uh, Mom, Robin, and I at the ceremonies. Here we are in the actual White House. They had Christmas trees all over the place. I mean, it was gorgeous. If you ever get a chance to go visit the White House during Christmas, I would say during that season, I, you, you have to go. It's just gorgeous. And here's the picture everyone's seen in the Oval Office. Uh, I mean, it was just tremendous to be able to talk to the president. Uh, the Oval Office 
is actually like you see on TV. The doors are short and skinny, which is weird. He's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, like Perry's height. But uh, it's, it's weird. I'm, I'm thinking, does he bend over to get in there? I mean, it's real short. So they never modified the doors. And the president, I see how he's president. He's very personable. He remembers your name and he talks to you and uh, treats you like a person. And I could see how that would win a lot of votes. And so it was quite an honor to actually be in the Oval Office and he made time to meet with us. When we went there, uh, we were walking to the White House and then the helicopters came out, the guys on the motorcycles and they said, no one move. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh man, what did y'all do? <laughs> I'm going down with them. Then here comes these cars, you know, the president's cars. And we found out the president uh, from Afghanistan was there. So he actually made time to still meet with us even though um, um, President Karzai was there. So that's the White House and I end with, uh, cause everyone's gonna ask me, so here are the boys. <laughs> that's Jackson and Julian. Everyone wants to know how they're doing and that's Jackson's uh, recent science project. He got all hundreds on it. And that's Julian holding the DVD for me to go play for him. <laughs> so they're eight and four. And so with that, I, I'll say thank you. And I really want to say thank you to Mr. Jones. Where's uh, Mr. Jones at? So many people here don't know, but when I was in high school and I was applying to college, Mr. Jones came and spent a lot of time with me and my family saying, look, son, this is where you need to apply. This is what you need to do. And you know how he talks. Now leave that alone over there. Go do this. So Mr. Jones was part of my infrastructure, my fabric, and my development of who I am and where I am today. And there are many of you in this room who played a role in that as well. And I'm greatly appreciative of all that you have done for me and my family. And the times we spent together, many of you, uh, a lot of friends here from high school that are lifelong friends. And all of that played a role in who I am and the way I see the world today. And I guess that's why people often when I come around, they say I'm very different. But I accept that and I see it as uh, a compliment. And I like to pay tribute and end and take questions. And, and in doing so, uh, Mr. Jones, will you come up here real quick? In doing so, Mr. Jones and I share a lot in common, and many of you as well. So I wanted to, to share this with everyone. And these are our roots. Oh, yeah. You got Pop over there, All right? Deal. That's my dad, for those that don't know. This is Mr. Jones' dad, and that's my Uncle Jimmy, and you guys know, yeah. So those are the guys. <laughs> and, and with that, as a way to say thank you for what you've done for me, I want to present you with that's stupid. something <laughs> here. <laughs> On behalf All of right. myself, All and right. I'm not done, <laughs> and Miami University, this is a mentoring oh, that's awesome. award as well. That's awesome. So, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I'll be back next year. <laughs> Juan, is there any possibility to come back to uh, Ohio, maybe run for governor or something? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I had to ask my wife. She's gotten used to the South. Um, that would, it would take a lot to do that. But I, I, you never know. I, what I have learned is you never say never because I would have never said I, I would be where I am today if you had asked me many years ago. I never thought of even being a professor. So you never say never. Hi, can you discuss Prime 3 a bit more, um, particularly the different groups of people with disabilities how it's going to um, provide that equal access to the voting process. Mm -hmm. Roll out, where has it been rolled out? Mm -hmm. What are some of the um, barriers that you may be finding in trying to extend the places that you're rolling it out, that sort of thing? Well, uh, 
the way it works, I have a YouTube video actually, so you can email me and I could uh, share it with you. But um, it's a touch screen and a headset and it has a printer. So the way it works is if you don't have a disability, you could just touch it and vote and it prints your ballot. It's a unique ballot it prints that shows only the contest and who you voted for. So it eliminates any ambig ambiguity about who you selected. If you, for example, are blind, then you would listen to it and it would say to vote for Jimmy Jones, say vote. And you could say vote or blow into the microphone and it would make a selection. And then it would print and it can read back the printout to you. We've used it in student elections. The National Society of Black Engineers is the world's largest student run organization. They've used it the last four years. Uh, this year we'll be doing pilots in uh, South Carolina, Oregon, Maryland, and we won't do a pilot in Ohio this year. There's not an election in Ohio, a municipal election, for example. Uh, so we, we're gonna do demonstrations in Ohio and probably have, uh, have it for election maybe in 13 or something. Uh, it's interesting, so just to show you how this works, the, I'm not gonna say any names, but someone uh, in a high ranking position in the state of Ohio found out about what we were doing and I was in a meeting with this person and uh, I was giving a presentation and somebody said, uh, and he graduated from Miami and the person stood up, I'm a Miami grad, let's talk. <laughs> and a lot of things happened because of that. What I like to do is this, I like to give uh, Wani a token of our appreciation. This is our dick massage that we generally give to our special guests and so forth. This is really fresh, I made this this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's yeah. really fresh in between Garfield and Manhattan High here. Uh -huh. This is a token of our appreciation. Yeah. And I'd also like to give this, what is the mayor? Right here. Sir? I'd also like to give these uh, rose, I mean, yeah. these carnations. Miss Irma, please come, come on. Oh. Happy time. Oh. What a impressive young man. Not just what he teaches, but also how he teaches. And city council, you name say one to recognize you, so we got some gifts for you. This is gonna take a couple minutes. First proclamation, and again, this was unanimous, and uh, council member Kathy Klink was here earlier. She was at the table this evening. Right. This is a proclamation. Office of the mayor and city council, proclamation. Whereas the mayor, city council, and the city administration, the city of Hamilton, Ohio, are extremely honored to recognize Dr. Juan Gilbert, a city of Hamilton native, whose dedication to mentoring, technology, and research has led to recognition by his peers, as well as the President of the United States. And whereas Dr. Gilbert, a professor and chair of Human Centered Computing Division at Clemson University, was presented the 2011 Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring in Washington, D.C. And whereas Dr. Gilbert, who attended Harrison Elementary School, George Washington Junior High School, Hamilton High School, yeah and graduated from Miami University, University of Cincinnati, was honored by the President of the United States, Barack Obama, for a number of esteemed accomplishments, among them having mentored one-third of the nation's African-American PhD students in computer science, research in electronic voting, and being named a top scholar in the area of technology. And whereas dedication to scholarly pursuits of computer science exemplifies a life of commitment to solving real-world problems, and his dedication has garnered a multi-million dollar project to increase the accessibility of technological voting systems for the physically challenged, about which he also testified before Congress. And whereas Dr. Gilbert has provided the city of Hamilton and students of Hamilton a shining example of how hard work, education, and dedication can lead to success. He is a shining example of what this city produces, and we thank him for his global leadership in innovation and technology. Dr. Gilbert has completed a powerful full circle, full circle journey from mentored student to mentoring adult. Now, therefore, I, Pat Moeller, Mayor of the City of Hamilton, Ohio, and members of Hamilton City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2012, the entire month, as Dr. Juan Gilbert Month in the City of Hamilton, Ohio. And congratulations, Dr. Juan Gilbert, for making a difference in the pursuit of scholarly research, next generation mentorship, and civic contribution, which impacts the lives of all Americans. So, we give this to you. Thank you. And it's not on there as well as it should be, but we'll fix that here in a little bit. But that's yours, Dr. Juan Gilbert Month, okay? The entire month. Oh, wow. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, I'm not done yet. Okay, we'll put this down here for now. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to hear the end of that tonight. I can see that. Okay. Education is the key. So we've got a key to the city for the educator, and that is you. So I'm honored to give you a key to the city of Hamilton, Ohio. This is Dr. Juan E. Gilbert, February 14th, 2012. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's so well deserved. Now, one more thing, then I'm off the stage, finally. Thank you. But, you know, you went to Auburn. You taught at Auburn, I guess. That's mm -hmm. a, an SEC school. Yeah. And, and you're at Clemson now. It's an ACC school. But the best water in the world is in the Miami Valley area. That's right. An MAC school, Miami University. So. That's right. I've got you a six-pack of Hamilton water. <laughs> the best tasting water in the entire world. Yes. Okay. And thank you for being such a, a great you. role model. Thank, thank you very, you. very much. We're very proud of you. Thank you. I tell people about this all the time. Now I have evidence. <laughs> One more hand.